I'm a neuroscientist and um, happen to be interested in tinnitus as well, um, partly because I have tinnitus myself, off and on. It's uh, not constant. I have what's called intermittent tinnitus, which is a particularly interesting form because I can be my own control. And I think I've um, come to some conclusions about tinnitus from kind of observing myself in some situations. So one of the interests that I'm homing in on now is uh, the effects of sleep on tinnitus. Um, I, that one of the observations that I've made myself when I'm stressed out and I get little sleep, then my tinnitus gets worse. And then when I go to sleep after this uh, period of uh, intense work on a grant, for example, or a uh, publication, then uh, you get time to relax and you get a good night's sleep and the tinnitus may be gone completely the next morning. So I think that's a very powerful, interesting observation. And we're trying to find uh, the reasons for that, neurobiologically, what goes on in the, in the brain when you sleep, there are different sleep stages. And we're trying to figure out which sleep stage is most important for getting rid of the tinnitus. Um, I don't want to preempt any conclusions right now, but, but there, there are some interesting findings that we have already, and hopefully soon we'll be able to tell more about this. Yeah, um, certainly. Uh, it's always good to have a theory. So we think that uh, one of the factors that um, that is very, one of the, uh, let's, let's be concrete, uh, we're looking for neurotransmitters that are important for both tinnitus and sleep. And there's been a, a so-called serotonin theory of tinnitus for, for some time. And with our model that we've been proposing on frontosphagal gating, um, serotonin may also play a role. Uh, there's a nucleus uh, called the nucleus of Cumbens that uses dopamine and serotonin as one of the transmitters. And sleep is also dependent on serotonin. So insomnia, for example, is um, precipitated by uh, lack of serotonin. And has, this is something that it has in are common with uh, depression, certain forms of depression, also dependent on serotonin. So one of the standard treatments for depression is uh, to take serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So that boosts the level of serotonin in the brain. And so this is one of the theories, you know, that, that this could be all mediated by the same kind of neurotransmitter. And um, I have to admit that I'm not a sleep researcher by definition. So it's something that I got myself into and I'm learning as we as we speak and different sleep stages depend on different parts of the brain. There are different brain rhythms associated with different sleep stages. There's a deep sleep and then there's a light sleep stage, there's a REM sleep where we dream. And then the you know awakenings during the night as well where we completely awake. So usually it's at least four sleep stages. And um if we can for example tie the deep sleep, stage, deep sleep stage to to tinnitus. That would be interesting because then we can draw certain conclusions which part of the brain in which neurotransmitter may be responsible for tinnitus and also for restoring the normal stage. Yeah, so there's um, now all kinds of things, gadgets on the market, you know, activity trackers that, that also uh, can track your sleep stages used to be much more complicated. You used to have a EG measured and that, that from EG you can determine what kind of sleep stage you're in. Now the activity trackers can do that. Um, maybe not quite as precisely, but you know, good enough for our purposes. And um, there's actually a colleague of mine who came up with this. Um, uh, this is Rebecca Lewis at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary at Harvard University. Um, we talked about this at the last ARO meeting in Baltimore. And um, so she suggested one of these trackers. And I've been using it lately to, to track my own sleep. And, um, and in fact, I, this morning, I, when I gave my, my talk here at, uh, at the TRI meeting, um, I, you know, I was giving some anecdotal stories about this, you know, when I for example, the first time I noticed how sleep uh, is important for tinnitus or not uh, is when I 
years ago when I when I started to have tinnitus, I I had to uh, write a grant. You know, very, grant writing in in the United States is essential for getting funded. You know, everybody has to do that, and um, so you work for several weeks very intensely, get very little sleep, and and my tinnitus went up went through the roof. And then my grant was done, and I submitted it. Okay, happy and a good dinner and a good night's sleep and the next morning tinnitus was completely gone. Same observation just now as I was traveling to this meeting at a 23 hour travel time flight uh, that got delayed and then they changed planes and my tinnitus went up, you know, crazy. And when I arrived here, I went to bed, slept well, the next morning tinnitus was gone. You know, just, there's two very Good examples, I think, you know, of how sleep can modulate your tinnitus in a, in a good way. And so, you know, this is, I think, about the whole story that uh, now we're trying to measure sleep stages from uh, anecdotal reports to more systematic investigations of how the two uh, things correlate the incidence of tinnitus and the strength of tinnitus and uh, amount of, let's say, REM sleep or deep sleep you get. Um, and that, that you know might give us the first result and then we'll go on from there to to investigate transmitters and so on sleep mechanisms and to somehow correlate with our model potentially yeah well i mean the, the one of the recommendations i always give uh to patients is that they should get enough sleep uh then of course one wants to do more than that and and get a, a more sound scientific basis why why this uh, is important, and you know, let's say, for example, it has to do with serotonin, then one would reopen that whole theory. People have tried that. There are several studies that tried uh, use of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, um, and they gave mixed results. But I, I'm of the opinion that uh, it, it may work in some people and not in others. So I think it would be worth reopening some of these trials. And actually, there was never a real trial, so I think one, one could do a clinical trial on this and then look at the responders and see whether they also have a, a pattern uh, of uh, insomnia or irregular sleep that would kind of correlate with their tinnitus. And I think that would be an interesting way of, um, of tackling this. Or there might be other medications that one is able to, to give to sort of help them sleep, and that might also help them with their tinnitus. Yeah, I love collaborations. My whole career is built on collaborations because one can't do everything oneself. And so I think um, these meetings uh, that you're attending right now, or ARO, or all kinds of um, sort of meetings within the discipline are important because even there, people do different things. Some people work with patients directly, others work with animals, or, uh, you know, in, in our basic science field. But even beyond the auditory sciences, I think that it's important to look beyond one's uh, tellerant. We have a, a German expression, you know, you look beyond your horizon. And, um, I think the neurosciences as a whole field should become more interested in tinnitus because it is a very, I think, challenging problem, both intellectually as well as from the health sciences point of view. And um, so that's one of the things I've been trying to do is sort of get the funding agencies interested in getting uh, the word out that this is uh, an example of a, of a top-down modulation that the brain does everywhere and all the time. We have a lot of connections in our brains that are top-down connections. Mostly we seem to think of auditory processing or visual processing as a bottom-up process and it goes into our sensory end organs and then travels up into the brain into some higher regions where we don't know much about and, and but the information flow is also going in the opposite direction there's a lot actually a lot more information coming back from the prefrontal cortex say to the uh, more bottom uh, portions of the processing system and i think that needs to be studied and we just got a, a paper accepted about sound localization for example and it turns out when you look um, the old story about sound localization is that you know it happens in the brainstem, and this is where the signals from the two ears come together, and this is how we uh, can figure out whether something the sound comes from the left or the right. It's not as simple as that. 
actually goes way up into the auditory cortex and then in the prefrontal cortex comes back down again. So the executive functions of the brain are important in many, many instances of, of brain science. And here this is just one small example of that. And I think if we are able to understand these executive processes better, then we'll also um, come to a better understanding of, of some disorders like, like tinnitus.